Welcome to our Good Friday service. Tenebrae, the service of darkness. A welcome to all those from Cordata Presbyterian Church, from Spring, Presby from Spring Church, from St. James Presbyterian Church, and from FPC. And a welcome especially to those who are joining us on live stream. Even though you are not in the building with us, we are a community that worships together in person and online. I want to welcome you into an ancient practice, a very old practice, a very important practice, but a practice that is deeply foreign to most of us. Tonight we enter into the ancient practice of companioning Jesus in his suffering. Companioning Jesus in his suffering. This is written throughout the New Testament. It has been practiced around the world for 2,000 years. But where we exist as a tradition, we have been deeply impacted by some flawed theology to the extent that we are almost surprised to find that suffering exists or that is a part of the Christian journey. So the idea of companioning Jesus in his suffering feels almost foreign to us. Companion is a wonderful word. It is the word come, which means with, and pan, which means bread. Yesterday, we gathered four churches together, and we companioned with Jesus by sharing in the bread and the washing of the feet. Today, we companion in the suffering of Jesus. This misunderstanding and this foreignness to the companioning Jesus and his suffering is not new to our tradition. It has been around a long time. We look at this every year when we gather to companion Jesus and his suffering. There are 18 different windows all celebrating the life and the ministry of Jesus. And on this night, I always point out that window number 17 goes up to the Garden of Gethsemane. They are thankfully hidden today. Window 17 goes up to the Garden of Gethsemane. Window 18 is the empty tomb. The majority of the deeply suffering, difficult passages happen between those two windows. We have tried to rectify that today. Number one, you can see that every single, the win all of the windows are now covered with the stations of the cross that were done by Scott Erickson. Each of these stations of the cross points out something that happens between window 17 and window 18. As well, we are rectifying it by tonight. Tonight, we will walk the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. We will companion Jesus along the darkest and the worst part of suffering, crucifixion, and death. We will do it with the symbolism of darkness. We will enter into the last seven words that Jesus said while on the cross, and every time we finish a word, we will extinguish one of the candles and we will lower the lights until at the very end, we will be all together in darkness, remembering the suffering and the darkness of the Good Friday night. Like our weekly worship is a reminder to us that we are to be worshiping every day. The companioning of Jesus in suffering is not something we do only once a year. It is something we do throughout our lives. This service reminds us what it means to share in the suffering of Jesus. Our service will revolve around the seven last words that Jesus said before he was killed. They're found four in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and three of them are found in the Gospel of John. Tonight, the rhythm will be, you will see the words written up on the screen, there will be some quick field notes, and then the word will be read. And we invite you to enter into that reading of the word. There will be some silence and then usually a musical response, sometimes just silence. And then we will see the candle extinguished. In the first century, the cross was a form of capital punishment. It was for criminals, it was a long and tortuous death, not suitable for any Roman citizens. Death came slowly by exposure and by asphyxiation. 
It takes great effort while on a cross to raise up to get a breath. Death comes when the person is no longer able to make that effort. Roman soldiers would sometimes quicken the process by breaking the legs of the person on the cross. You will notice that the seven words we hear from Jesus are all quite brief. That is because the effort that it took to say each word was monumental. That makes these words all the more powerful. So let us prepare ourselves to companion with Jesus in the suffering of this evening. Prepare us, Lord. Prepare us to enter in to the darkest time, the darkest moments, the suffering, the pain, the deep grief. Prepare us, Lord, to enter and embrace the whole of this evening that we might also embrace with joy all that happened on Sunday morning. Be with us, Lord. Open our hearts, open our ears, open our eyes. Allow us to encounter and to companion you in this very difficult day. In your name we pray, and God's people said, Amen. Our context, it has been a long week, a long road since all the people said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. To get here, Jesus was betrayed by one of his own disciples, denied by another. Jesus was rejected by the religious leaders. He was slandered by witnesses. He was condemned on trumped-up charges in front of a kangaroo court. He was mocked. He was spat upon. He was cruelly dishonored. Hear this word of Scripture as we prepare to enter in to this evening. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and he said to them, You brought me this man as one who was perverting the people, and here I have examined him in your presence, and I have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. But the crowd, they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow. Release Barabbas for us. Give us Barabbas. Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Release Barabbas. This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. And Pilate wanted to release Jesus, address them again. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified. Crucified! Crucified! And their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder. And he handed Jesus over as they wished. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of the people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. Every year I find my go- myself gobsmacked by the first words that Jesus utters. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My words would have been different. Father, pay them back for the evil that they have done because they knew exactly 
what they were doing. But these final words of Jesus provide possibly the greatest illustration, the most fitting illustration for the ministry and the life of Jesus. His whole life said, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Forgive those who lied and those who bore false witness. Forgive those who practiced cruelty and violence. Forgive those who plotted and manipulated. Forgive those who denied and betrayed. Forgive the crowd. Forgive the puppet leader. Forgive the liars, the haters, the betrayers, the deniers. Forgive them all, Father. Even though they were cruel, they were heartless. They did not know what they were doing. 2,000 years later, the words are the same. Let us pay attention to the words of Jesus. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews.
I'd like to invite those of you who are fifth grade and younger, if you'd like to go downstairs, there is a godly play lesson that Care, Pastor Carey is leading. But I, right now, I want you to look around and see where you are. It's going to be darker when you come back. And I want you to notice where you are so you can make sure to come back right where your parents are. We'll leave some lights on. You can go meet Pastor Carrie in the back right there if you'd like to go with her for godly play. Any kids are invited to go right now. We will see you back for the sixth reading. I will mention that when we finish, all the lights will be out. We will relight the Christ candle as a sign of our hope. And at that point, you are invited to leave whenever you want, but please leave silently to give space for those who would like to continue reflecting, and you can stay here as long as you would like. So much bad has happened that this second reading is a surprising bit of grace and goodness. Every moment seems so full of humiliation and awfulness. And then a word of kindness, a word of support, a word of encouragement from the strangest place you would ever imagine, from another criminal on a cross. Scripture tells us Jesus was crucified between two criminals, and the word of grace is frankly shocking. One of the criminals speaks encouragement to Jesus. And the answer Jesus gives is possibly even more shocking. Today, you shall be with me in paradise. I tell you today, where we put the commas, as always, that's a big deal in how we understand this text. The text could be heard, truly I tell you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Or it could be read, truly I tell you, today you shall with, be with me in paradise. There's a great mystery in the kingdom about who will be with Jesus for eternal life. We are told in different places, those who have faith, those who have lived the promise, those who have entered into the kingdom life. We are told in other places that those who care for the poor and those who care for the marginalized. We are also told that some who claim to know the name of Jesus, Jesus will say, I never knew you. So there's a mystery. We never really know except here. Here is the one that we know. The thief on the cross, the criminal. After an act of decency, an act of courage, and an act of remarkable faith, Jesus says, truly today, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. We are reminded in the midst of all the suffering that there is a wideness, a wideness in God's mercy a wideness in the grace. It envelops tax collectors. It envelops sinners, prostitutes, liars, and a condemned criminal. It encompasses all of us with the hope that one day we shall be with him. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, 
since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responded, Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. One of the most oft-quoted psalms, texts in the crucifixion narrative, is Psalm 22. We'll hear the beginning of Psalm 22 in the next word. But today we will hear the middle of Psalm 22. They divided my clothing among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. Our third word involves six people, Jesus, the disciple John, and then four women, three Marys, Jesus' mother, Mary, wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and his aunt. The word of Jesus to his mother, woman, here is your son. The word to John, here is your mother. We need to remember The commandments, that one shall honor their father and mother. Jesus is leaving with one of his final words. He honors his mother, making sure that she will be cared for, that she will be watched over, reminding John and his mother that they now belong to each other. As you notice this gathering at the foot of the cross, I want you to notice that this is our first vision of the church. This small group gathering at the foot of the cross 
is the incipient church. They gather under the cross, they worship Jesus, and they are reminded that they belong to each other. From this little community will grow the one holy worldwide apostolic church, larger someday than they could ever imagine. But in this text, on this day, it exists at the foot of the cross where they belong to each other, as we belong to each other. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, uh, Let's not tear it. Let's cast lots to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Dear such love. 
forth words that we read are sometimes the hardest to digest. Our response to this word will be just to sit in silence. I said that we would hear the words of Psalm 22. The first line of Psalm 22 is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus will utter them in his Aramaic mother tongue, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And herein lies our conundrum. Psalms at that time had not been given a number. Psalm 22 was not known as Psalm 22. Instead, Psalm 22 was known by the first line, the same way that we often know hymns, not by what they are called, by what their first line is. So we don't know if on the cross, Jesus is yelling out these words of pain and suffering, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or if he is yelling out, Psalm 22. If you read Psalm 22, which I would encourage you to do this weekend, you will hear lines that say, all who see me mock me. You will hear lines that I am being poured out like water, that my bones are out of joint, that my mouth is dried up, that you lay me in the dust of death, that I can count all my bones, that they divide my clothing amongst themselves. It is a psalm that truly parallels a crucifixion experience. And yet, like many of the psalms, it ends in praise. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and God rules over the nations. To God, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before God shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for God. Posterity will serve God. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that God has done it. The beginning of the psalm is very clearly a part of this journey. And the end of the psalm is very clearly a part of this journey. So whether Jesus was sharing a word of deep anguish, whether he was uttering his very honest feelings, or whether he was uttering the amazing reality of Psalm 22, or whether he was doing both. There was also a belief at the time that Elijah would come before the Messiah. In the scriptures, Elijah was taken up and did not die. There is a moment here when they think maybe Jesus might have been calling for Elijah. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders, bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let's see if Elijah will come to save him.
Fifth word and the sixth word both come from the Gospel of John, right next to each other. The sixth word is, it is finished. The fifth word is, I thirst. But you will hear, it is finished, foreshadowed in the fifth word. There's a jar of sour wine, popular among Roman soldiers. In the midst of such cruelty, there is one more act of kindness. A sponge with sour wine is lifted up as Jesus thirsts. Notice, though, it is on a branch of hyssop, a very significant branch. Hyssop has a symbolic role in Jewish practice. During the Passover meal, after the killing of the lamb, it is a branch of hyssop that was dipped in the blood and used to mark the lintels of the door frame so that the angel of death would pass over the house. For John, this is just one more key connection between the story of Jesus and the experience of Passover. Jesus was killed on the Passover when the Israelites remembered their miraculous exodus the freedom from slavery. What the blood of the lamb has always done for the Jewish people is possibly put to a new use. But here the wine of communion is used to quench the thirst of Jesus and to mark the new exodus. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth.
Sixth word is quite short. It is finished. Near the end, Jesus has just enough energy to rise up and utter one final word. Finished. The disciples and the early church will come to understand much later on what was finished, what was done. But two things I want us to notice in this short text. One is the bowed head. It is important for us to know that in Greek culture, a bowed head was used to make a promise, a sworn affirmation. When a promise was made, a head was bowed. And second, we will hear Jesus hands over the spirit. Jesus gives up the spirit or his spirit. One of the challenges in all biblical interpretation is whether to capitalize or not capitalize the word spirit. If it is uncapitalized, it is our spirit or their spirit or his spirit. If it is capitalized, it becomes the Holy Spirit. On this one, we don't know. It could be that Jesus gave over his own spirit. Or this could be John's Pentecost, that Jesus hands over the Holy Spirit that he had promised his disciples would come. If this is really the start of the church, if they truly belong to each other, then here we see the Spirit handed over. It is finished. We know. Every ending is also a beginning. This may be the biggest of them all. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit.
Our final word, the seventh word, comes in the Synoptic Gospel, Luke. Matthew and Mark say that Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last, but the historian Luke writes out that the final cry before the final breath, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. This last word is uttered in darkness. The text will tell us that darkness comes at noon. Lights on earth are extinguished. He who came as the light is ending his life in darkness. We will hear of a mighty curtain, the temple curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. A very thick, a very heavy, a very solid curtain. Witnesses will affirm that that curtain rips in two. Separation between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the world has been breached. The border is now gone. Humans have access to the Holy of Holies, and at the same time, the Almighty has access to the humans. And in the most surprising story, possibly of all, that there is a Roman guard, a centurion, who recognizes the innocence of Jesus, that they have killed an innocent man. And the crowd recognizes, too, as the heaviness of what they have been a part of comes upon them. And they return home, beating their breasts. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, 
bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. 